All right, so I'm gonna be changing gears in a Ford 9-inch. This 9-inch came out of this 71 Mustang, and it came with the worst possible gearing. It had 2.73 gears on an open differential. So, she's a slow one-wheel wonder. Good freeway cruising, but that's about it. Now, I'm putting an AOD four-speed transmission behind it, so it's gonna have that overdrive gear. Since we had the overdrive, we decided we could get a little bit crazier with the gears. We're going with a 373 and a True Track Limited Slip. So for this, I'm going to need the 3.73 gears, the installation kit, which comes with, of course, new bearings, and then the True Track Limited Slip. One interesting thing here, there's a crush sleeve inside. So there's a crush sleeve inside here, okay? Now that crush sleeve is going to put tension on the bearings on the inside. So if you notice how this spins, but it doesn't just keep spinning, you know, like some super fast ball bearings, there's still some resistance to it. So that's the resistance that we're going to be measuring later with the inch-pound torque wrench. Alright, so I pulled the uh, pinion out of the pinion carrier and I figured since I had my press out I might as well press the bearings onto the new track lock. So uh, the, the bearing in order to press it down I'm actually using uh, the old bearing from the uh, open factory carrier. Now the other side. All right, so here is the uh, crush sleeve that I removed. Now keep in mind that I use this to press in the new uh, bearing as well. And here we are at uh, 11.751 millimeters. All right, and here's the new one. You can see it's a 12.46 millimeter. So it's not even one millimeter difference in crushing. So it's a very, very small amount. All right, the next step here is to take the pinion carrier, put it on top of the bearing we just installed, and then add the crush sleeve in between the new bearing that we're going to install on top. And then when we press this new bearing in, 
you just want to make sure that as you're pressing, you stop as soon as you meet the resistance of the, the crush sleeve. You don't want to crush that crush sleeve at all yet because the deflection, remember, is only less than one millimeter. So press the bearing down, and then as soon as you meet the resistance of the crush sleeve, that's when we stop. All right, your best bet is when you're pressing in this bearing to just make sure that you keep spinning around the carrier and feeling the amount of play. And once it's down to that one millimeter of play from the crush sleeve, that's when you wanna stop. But you will feel it. It takes a tremendous amount of force to crush that crush sleeve. So as you're pressing it down, you'll feel it as soon as it hits. Well, once we've got that pressed in, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put the yoke in. And so before I put the yoke in, I make sure to oil up the bearings and then install the seal. All right, this is a trick that I was taught for getting the pinion bearing preload started. Now you can do this by just continually tightening that nut, but it takes a tremendous amount of force to do it. So what we're gonna do here is press down on the pinion into the yoke until that play that's in the carrier is completely gone. So remember that play is less than one millimeter. So when you spin that carrier around, it's very, very small amount. You're just getting that tiny little, you know, three quarters of a millimeter play. And that's what we need to eliminate. And the hardest part with this crush leaf is just getting the crush started. And that's what makes it so easy to mess up if you over tighten it just a hair. So I found that if you start with the press, that'll start the, the action of the crushing and as soon as that action is started, then you can finish it off with the nut much easier. So you can see here, I'm testing the amount of play and it's just gonna be a little pump, check the play, a little pump, check the play. And I'm pumping it like an eighth of a pump. And uh, there's, there's no penalty here for going slow, as slow as you need to go to just make sure that you don't uh, over, overload that, uh, that preload that we're looking for. So you'll see just little pump, spin it around, little pump, spin it around, little pump, spin it around. And I'm just making sure that I still have that one millimeter of play. Now, uh, uh, the last pump you're gonna do is gonna be the one that eliminates that play. So it's just pump it, check, pump it, check, pump it, check. And then as soon as you pump it and there's no more play, then you spin the carrier around. And as soon as that carrier doesn't continue to spin freely, it just, it stops, then you know, bam, we've got that preload. So it's coming up here pretty soon. And then all of a sudden, just one more pump, boom. And then you spin it and it's gone. And you can tell right away. You go, okay, well, that play is gone. And then you see how it spins around, but it doesn't continue to like freewheel there. You spin it and it stops. That's when you know. All right, it's time to test the pinion bearing preload. So I've got it on my vise here. I built just a, a little bracket here to hold on to it. And then uh, this is a, a little tool that I made. It's very simple. But I did this for um, removing the clutch, on uh, the fan clutch on Fords that I was working on. It really was driving me nuts. And so it also works for this, but it's real simple just to hold it in place. Um, here is my, uh, it's a torque wrench here, and you can see right now we're at 10 inch pounds of resistance, and so I do need to tighten it just a little bit, and I'll show you how to do that.
All right, so we ended up at uh, 15 inch pounds. Once you spin it around a few times, uh, back and forth, you know, then you can uh, get a little bit more accurate reading. So we ended up at 15 pounds and that's where it's gonna stay. So the next step here, uh, you take the uh, third member here and we're gonna knock out this uh, bearing. Now, when you flip it around, you'll see on the other side, there's a little metal retainer and that metal retainer just has these little like tension teeth and so you can just knock it out. Uh, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of force. Okay, here's the retaining clip. We've got my socket here, so you can see how it gets hammered in. You just want to make sure that you don't hammer it in on these little teeth here. Those little teeth are what uh, tension it in there. So I just want to show that to you. All right, now these uh, ring gears can be a little bit of a pain to get on. So you can see I, I tap them on just enough so that I can then get my guide bolts in. The first two guide bolts, I don't use any thread locker on. I use those just to pull the ring a little tighter. And then you can see I'm adding thread locker to the other two. And then once uh, I pull that ring gear just a little bit tighter, then I remove those guide bolts and then I apply the thread locker to those. And then of course, obviously to all the, the next ones to get the thread locker. Okay, so here's a little trick I developed for torquing the ring gear bolts. Now these have to be torqued to 70 foot-pounds, which is quite a lot. And so what I do is I take a wooden block on the bottom to protect the ring gear, and then I use two clamps, just four inch C-clamps. I use two 5 8 uh, sockets, and basically all it does is it gives me something to slip my little pry bar through and see how it's not touching the bearing it's not touching anything else and this allows me to get this breaker bar in here and hold it in place while I torque it down 
And of course, you have to move it around as you go. This, this is what I do. It works very well. All right, I've got the carrier installed. I am having a little bit of an issue. You can see the spanner nut on this side is pretty far in, and on this side is pretty far out. And this is the only spot where the bolts aren't going to touch and the carrier isn't going to rub on the inside, and where the carrier isn't going to rub right here near the uh, pinion bearing. So uh, this will almost certainly not allow us to get a good wear pattern. So what I'm going to have to do is I am going to have to grind away just a little bit in here to make room for this carrier so that I can then install it without anything interfering. Now if you do have to do any grinding on your carrier, Make sure at that point you clean it really well afterwards. I'm using some uh, brake clean here. I don't love brake clean, but if you have metal particles, you're gonna have to get every, every bit of it as clean as possible. So I'll spray this sucker down, and then while I'm at it, I'll clean the uh, gasket surface. measuring the ring gear run out right now. See once I get it set to zero, I get about a about a thousand, maybe one point five. Ooh, almost two. It kinda it's such a sensitive device. It can a lot of it depends on which direction you're going or how fast you're moving it. But very little run out. Alright, the next step is going to be installing the pinion carrier into the third member here. And this is the shim that I removed from it, so it's the factory shim. I found that uh, that's, that's usually a good starting point. And so you'll, you might have to go up or down from there, but uh, that's a good place to start. When you change out the gear ratio, you're going to have a higher likelihood that you're going to need to change that shim, but it's always a good starting point. Uh, this uh, table here, this little mount, this is just an engine stand that I just welded up some angle iron brackets and made a little mount. It makes it a little easier to install.
All right, let's talk about carrier bearing preload, and that's for the bearings that your carrier rides on. So there's three ways to do this as far as I know. Now the Ford recommended way measures case deflection from here to here. So you use a special tool, a dial indicator that mounts on this side, reaches over to the other, and then you'll tighten it down until the case actually deflects. So that's how much force is on it. The case actually moves itself apart. I believe it's eight thousandths of an inch is what you're looking for there. Now I've never done it that method because I don't have that tool and because they have different types of axles. So if you have a nodular nine inch versus a non-nodular nine inch, the deflection can vary and I just haven't found that to be super helpful. The other way I've seen is where somebody will take a, a used axle, they'll take a spare axle they have, slide the axle in there, cut off the axle, weld on a nut, and then you can measure the amount of force that's required to spin it. Now I don't do that because I would have to have a 28 spline and a 31 spline and you'd have to turn them into tools and keep those around. I don't, I've never done that, I've never needed to. So the way I do it is I tighten down, this is the driver's side for reference from the back, I tighten down the driver's side until the ring gear makes contact and has zero backlash against the pinion. Obviously this side here, which is the passenger side, will be loose while I'm doing that. Not totally loose, but just far enough away so that I can get zero backlash. Then I'll tighten down this side, which is forcing it away as it tightens it so that, uh, so that it starts to slowly create backlash as the bearings preload. So as it seats inside those bearings, it forces them it forces it this direction, and then you start to slowly develop backlash. And I'll do that until I get until I'm at the recommended backlash. In this case, it ended at 11 thousandths, which I'm very happy with. All right, so here's the tool that I made for tightening this up. It's just a three-quarter inch square tubing with two five-sixteenths bolts welded to it. Pretty simple. So I'm tightening down the uh, ring side until I have that uh, zero backlash and then I'm tightening down the non-ring gear side to start to slowly create that uh, tension and uh, backlash. So this is just to show you how I have my dial indicator set up on the tooth. I think right here it's still at about eight thousandths. And so it took two more clicks to the passenger side or the, the non-ring gear side to uh, create that backlash that I need and the uh, carrier preload. So here's the grease that comes with the installation kit. And so I put it on at least four or five teeth you want to make sure you get it on both sides and then when you're spinning this around to start to create that wear pattern just make sure that you put some tension on it I use my left hand here and just kind of hold it but the more tension you have the better the wear pattern is going to look now because I started off with the factory shimming it ended up pretty good it was pretty close and so I'll zoom in here in a second you can see the drive side is a little bit too far out towards the outer part of the ring and then the coast side is a little bit too far in so ideally you want them both very you know centered with the coast side just slightly in you know uh, towards the, the inside of the ring but uh, what's what's really important is to make sure that you still have surface area of the ring all the way around the outside that uh, is not really being worn you want to get just as much of the wear pattern inside the meat of the teeth as possible. So you can see the wear pattern is real nice, but has to move in just a little bit. And then I think I show you the coast side over here. You can see the coast side looked good. It was just, just a hair in. So you can look online uh, or with your ring kit. A lot of times it comes with uh, little diagrams that show the wear pattern and shows you which direction you need to go, you know, bigger shims, smaller shims, but it'll take a little bit of work to get that right, but just keep going until you have a wear pattern you like. Okay, this is how the uh, wear pattern ended up. You can see it's very close to centered on the drive side and then the coast side is just slightly lower but the uh, same overall pattern
Oh yeah.